Hi. <laughs> Not my page, so I'm just gonna wait for Alma, and um, we'll get started soon. I'll do a reading from a fire like you and from Nectar. Let's see. Let me just drink some water to clear my throat. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hey, babes! I can't even see you. What's happening? Oh, hello! Hey, can you see me now? I can what see you. What did these earrings remind you of, girl? Yes, <laughs> that's yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> you How are you? You look amazing. Feeling. What? You look amazing. Yes. All Thank of you it. so much. And so do you. Thank you for giving me a reason to actually get up out of bed and uh, get dressed. Oh, <laughs> yes. How have you been, friend? You. It's tough. <clears throat> it's tough. I've been, I've been okay, though. Um, mm -hmm. Just bored as hell and uh, mm -hmm. worried as hell. That's all. How have you been? I've been okay. Um, I've had to work from home. Guys, mm -hmm. working from home is a myth. It is a lie. Yeah. Um, sure. Wait, Alma, like, that's my life, though. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, my company is just all up in here with these never-ending teleconferences. I'm no. like, we don't even talk this much at the office. Why do y'all want to talk <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic? You know, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> no, they're doing too much. They're doing too much. I'm looking um, at the painting. So much at the it's nice. Sorry? It's like, I what like are you it. saying about the painting? Oh, Black thank you. Magic. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, I need to replace it with a, with a picture of me and Babe, but it's, it'll come. Oh, I thought you said me and you. I was like, yes, I'm a, our friendship. <laughs> I'm but we forget. Okay. We forget you are within. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> well, hi everybody. Ophelia and I are having a moment here. Um, super excited to welcome you guys to the live discussion and reading of um, Ophelia's work. I need to introduce Ubile. I'm so excited to introduce Ubile. I'm going to read her bio because it is Black Girl May Mangik. So, Ubile Shisela is a storyteller from Malawi and a graduate, a two-time graduate, of the University of Oxford. She's known for her short and powerful poems. Mm, let them know, girl. Shisela recently signed a three-book publishing deal with U.S.-based publishing house, Andrews McNeil. Shisela's poetry and prose is housed in soft magic and nectar and are now a fire like you. She was among the 2019 Forbes Africa 30 and the 30 list. Chisala has been featured in several publications, to name a few. OK Africa, Huffington Post, LSA, Essence, Glamour, and more. She lives in Johannesburg. Welcome to the Cheeky Natives, Ms. Three Time I love you guys. <laughs> it's really super cool for me, because the first time you had an event in South Africa, the Cheeky Natives hosted you in, was it in Newtown? You did. <laughs> so packed, I, so packed. I loved you so much I had to move here. I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> you know what, if we're going with that, listen, I'm here for it. I'm absolutely here for it. Welcome to the Cheeky Natives. How are you? I'm good. I'm trying to, let me see if my sound can get any better. Also, I'm wearing this, but uh, 
we'll, we'll survive. <clears throat> no, you look good. We can hear you. You sound good. You look good. You out here. Girl, I'm good. so hyping me. <laughs> <laughs> I might just take over this channel, lock y'all out. <laughs> oh my girl, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do. Don't let the devil use you. Okay. Don't let the devil use you. So we're super, super excited. Congratulations. Three books in. What? How does it feel to know that you have three books under your belt? From having, from having been self-published, right? So, I mean, I guess the real question is, please take us through the journey. You know, you self-published your first two books, and now you've signed this amazing three-book deal with an American publishing house and you're actually on your third book which is what we're talking about today and um, I just want to know what has that journey been like had you ever imagined in your wildest dreams that this is what it would look like no it was a jump <laughs> um, it was really scary I think in 2018 ish at the end of 2000, 2017 2018 um, my now literary agents contacted me and I was like, this is jokes. I mean, I'm just someone who writes poetry and loves poetry. And I self-published because um, mostly I was just intimidated, uh, scared to submit my work, but also I didn't think anybody cared for my work. And then, so my literary agents contacted me and I was like, this is a joke. And then my publishers actually contacted me at the same time. And so... I was like, which route do I go with? Do I go straight with the publisher or do I have someone represent me? Because I want longevity. If I'm actually mm -hmm. going to take on a career in writing, might as well um, do something beyond just going straight to a publisher. So it was, it was a really scary process. It took me months to decide who to sign with first. And then once I finally signed, yeah, it got terrifying because I have deadlines, I have people to answer to. I have, you know, people going back and editing my work and checking it and checking, like, oh, what does that really mean? You're going from using um, American English to British English back and forth. Oh, why is there no comma here? Like, silly, like, school things. That you were, I was like, I didn't know I had to deal with this. I just write for writing's sake. But um, they taught me how to respect poetry. Mm. Um, how to respect the process of writing, how to be accountable, because I know there are people who are rooting for me. So it was a, it was an experience, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're here to have a live discussion slash launch slash celebration of your latest work. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us about your latest work? Let's see it, girl. Yeah. First of all, I live with the clumsiest person who puts oil and whatever who uses as a coaster so that's what my husband thinks of my poetry put him in rice um, put him in rice put, put him in rice so put him ah cannot be right well so the, the latest collection a fire like you is my third poetry collection and i think it may be my last <laughs> uh because i want to delve into writing novels we'll see how that works out but a fire like you is kind of a more mature version of the first two books, but mm -hmm. also just like a summation of my experience when it comes mm -hmm. to poetry. I'm saying my last poetry book for now, maybe in a few years I'll do it again. And so in the same vein, like of, with my other work, I celebrate blackness, I celebrate women, um, very introspective stuff, uh, going through past traumatic experiences and kind mm -hmm. of pulling poetry from them and, and like nectar which kind of has um follows a theme a fire like you also does and so it goes from wound which is the first chapter which is basically about yes. delving into like what is wrong with you what had happened in your life what hurt you what are some of your hurts and then it goes to hunger now that you know these are your hurts what do you desire like what do you want mm -hmm. for yourself? do you want to get better do you want to heal um and then soon because um, I was in the love when I wrote this book. I thought soon it's necessary because when I go and read poetry and I start reading the lovey-dovey poems, people are like, oh, no, go back to the drama. We want the drama. I'm like, no, uh, we, we, we deserve that. goodness. We deserve love. So, yes. yeah, that's why I included soon. And then the last chapter, Sister, mm -hmm. which is the most important because once you've healed, once you know what you uh, desire, once you know what you want when it comes to love, who 
do you talk to about all these experiences? Mm. Your girlfriends? Who are the people who lift you? Who are the yes. people who lift you? It's your girls. Um, and so sister was important because I always want to put women at the forefront of my work, even though it's at the, the last chapter. It's there for a reason. Yeah. Mm. So I think that um, we should begin uh, with readings. I, I think that everyone is just here, is here for the poetry. Um, mm. And then we'll just have a discussion, but I think we'll have the discussion in between the reading. We mm. are super, super excited for this book um, because of lockdown. Hey, Ro, shout out to lockdown. <laughs> uh, it's been a little bit... It's, I think it's been it's been difficult, you know. So that, and I think that poetry is for times such as such as this, right? So super super excited for you to just take it away. We're super keen to hear the reading, and then we'll just uh, every now and then I'll be like, "Girl, wow!" <laughs> so you said you wanted some poems from um, Nectar. I don't know if you had requests, but I was going to do that. Or should I just go straight into a fire like you? Let's, yeah, you know what, we'll, we'll wait. If anybody has special, special requests, they can put it in the comments book. But we're really here as a, to celebrate your latest book. I think um, Next is beautiful. Next I had, had a, a special place. You always have a special place for me because why? Mm -hmm. But I, I'm really excited to hear about your new work. And, you know, we'll, we'll go back to next time. Put, put in your request, guys. Put in your request. <laughs> put in your request. It's the radio station. <laughs> yeah, girl. Radio Cheeky Natives. What you know about that? Radio Cheeky Natives. Okay. As black as tax. Here, we were never once children. Here, our mothers like Mary birthed saviors. Our only purpose is to redeem. Month end is for working miracles. Little black Jesuses. Let there be light and water rent and bread hmm. i think moving to south africa is the first time i really ever heard of black tax um yeah so that's what that poem was about <clears throat> uh i also write a lot of poems about my grandmother mm -hmm. so this is one go go i guess your heart needed the rest after a whole life of holding everyone in it. Mm. So the good thing about A Fire Like You, one of the awesome things is that I got to collaborate with yes. um, some artists from South Africa. Tell us, tell us about that because uh, I think this was your first poetry anthology that had the textual Mm -hmm. um line joins um and i mean so i'm curious about why you made that that editorial decision but also tell us a little bit about the the woman that you could the people you collaborated with and what motivates you to pick those particular people because it's interesting <laughs> yeah so i've always been drawn to um all types of art and line drawings are kind of my favorite um and I, w I just thought the book needed something more. Like if I was going to go out, I wanted to go out with a bang. But also, um, I think talking about A Fire Like You being a mature book, more mature than my other work, the reason why I didn't collaborate with anyone before is because I was afraid. Like you're afraid to share spaces with people um, because often you're like, oh my gosh, what if the drawings are better than the poetry? What if this, this, this? I was so scared and I've been scared of collaborations because um, it kind of comes from an insecurity within myself mm. about my own work. It's nothing to do with anybody else. And so at this time I was like, no, what is the point of me having this opportunity, this amazing publisher, um, having this chance to finally share my work um, and it's, it, it being supported by an actual publishing house, why not share this opportunity with other women who mm. um, are excellent? So. It's Neil Page and Lulama Wolf who are the ones who contributed to this work. And it was kind of weird. I found Neil on Instagram and I just loved her drawings and I was just drawn to her. I, was, I messaged her and I was like, let's meet, please. And basically, <laughs> I'm constantly trying to work business ideas and trying to do this. I'm like, do this for me. Put this on a shirt. I want this here. And she's like, okay, let's, and she's just the meekest little quietest person ever. And she's, she's like, what do you actually want? And I was like, 
I want you to draw for my book. And so mm. we started and we just at my house, um, at my dining room table, she, she read the poems, I printed them out, I had them all laid out and then she read the poems and then she started imagining things and I told her how I love to uh, emphasize women's form and I want every drawing to have a story. And some, some drawings are actually attached to a poem, some drawings are attached to the chapter. So mm. that's how I met Nell. And then um, Lulama and I had started recently a, a friendship and I had seen her process as she painted. Mm -hmm. And I was also so drawn to her work. And I was like, you two have very distinct types of drawing because Nell is more like the line and Lulama is an all around artist. She paints too. So I said, why not combine this two? And and then they were just graceful enough to allow me to have access to their work and to allow me to hover over them as they did this mm -hmm. stuff. And then we made it happen. So that's how it worked. And it's, it just fits naturally onto the page. It's a friendship that I that seems like it always existed. So yeah. Oh I, love, I love that. I mean, you often talk about how central Black women are to your poetry and to your writing. And I think it's so beautiful that you you then got these two black women whose work you loved and admired to contribute to your book. And there's, there's something in that, right? In the ways in which black women can write about and can draw themselves and can bring themselves to the imagination in a way that I don't think that anybody else can quite do for us. Um, you said that, you know, you moved, you love South Africa so much after our, <laughs> our events i will never let you live that down um and you moved here right i'm actually yeah. curious about what the move because you've lived in a, in a in a number of different places um you're malawian born uh -huh. you studied in the u.s you were then in the uk and now you live in south africa and i'm curious about how that that moving but also that moving to south africa influenced your writing because i mean you primarily wrote the bulk of your book here having moved around a lot mm -hmm. prior to that and so i'm curious about how that's influenced your writing so in the the previous two books i think soft magic i wrote in the states actually i've written all three of my, of my books on different continents so soft magic I wrote yes <laughs> that was not a brand <laughs> So yeah, Soft Magic I wrote in this, Nectar I wrote in the UK, and A Fire Like You I wrote here. I think, for me, I'm just, I just keep returning to that maturity level. And, and I was, for the first time in a long time, um, since I was like 17 when I first moved from, to the States, when I was in Malawi, I was surrounded by black people again. And I think that kind of influenced my work this time around because I was like, what problems are pertinent to you? Like, what issues do you face in your community? Like, the first poem I just read about black tax, it was something that was unfamiliar to me because traveling in these different places, I was often the only black person um, in my group of friends or the only African person in my group of friends. So my poetry was kind of different. It was more about me, like, trying to find a voice for myself, trying to love myself alone. And then now being surrounded by all this black love, um, all these people who are so good to themselves and good to writers, like showing up to events and actually having the room filled with people who look like you, th that was a f the first for me, a first thing in my life. And it's meant so much that I'm constantly inspired by um, particularly black creators who are just living their complete truths and who are honest and who give a damn and I think that's what I've picked up on here and I love the experience of living in South Africa it's it's <laughs> it's incredible yeah mm. but it's it's also, about... it also comes with these problems and yeah mm. yeah we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit um... <laughs> Mm, yeah um you're talking about black black creators and living your truth and you've also said that you believe that this will be your last book of poetry so before you uh before you read again for us um, i'm curious about why you want to make that shift uh you said you want to write novels you want to look at writing in long form so mm -hmm. what what is what is that writing in long form mean? and i mean you've had a lot of success as a poet so i'm curious about what's inspired you to make that shift from from poetry to to the long form and if you'll ever come back to poetry 
So I keep telling myself that this is my last poetry book for a while to kind of push myself to write a novel. But even today I was writing poetry. Um, why I want to make this shift? I think I want to establish, establish myself as a writer, um, mm. as a serious writer, especially when you write short poetry. There is this kind of tendency for people to think it's jokey, it's captiony, and that's about it. Um, mm. But I do have things that I've written that are longer and that mean so much to me. It's just... <coughs> I love the conciseness and mm -hmm. I, of, of my poetry and people who write like me because there's a whole story. Like there's a whole novel in whatever is it, four lines, five lines. There's a whole story there. And when you read it, you read some, you read it one way. Another person reads it, they'll read into it another way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I, I, I just want to explore novel writing. Perhaps mm -hmm. I can do it. <laughs> we'll see. Um, yeah, yeah, but I'm also very critical of people's novel so i don't know if i could do it myself and put it out there because i'm like yo the way i was throwing shade when i didn't recommend that book somebody else is gonna probably like not recommend and that's book okay book. right i think that there is there is space for a multiplicity of books to to exist and i, I don't i don't think that black women can ever write enough about ourselves about our experiences about things mm -hmm. that center us and like you know there's lots of conversations about, oh, this, this black author writes, ah, chick lit, you know, and it's almost this idea that when black women write, black women need to write about heavy issues like race or yeah. else, you know, this book doesn't work. And I think that there's a space for multiplicity of stories to exist, even, even in, in poetry, right, that poetry doesn't have to look a certain way in order for it to hold space and to hold importance. So I, I am keen, write your book, girl, do your thing, do your thing, girl, do your thing. Are you going to launch it? Me, and my friend, call me. <laughs> you um, are <laughs> As long as you launch it and you're not laughing at me in the back, like, eesh, eesh, that girl. Friend, but do I must you be a shaky character on our Instagram? <laughs> we know you. You read like 20 books a day, okay? <laughs> You'll probably be hard to please, hey? <laughs> I'm Listen, girl. I stand, I stand, I stand black <laughs> women. I think that there will always be be space for black women's stories, whether I enjoy them or not. I think there will always be space for black women's stories. And there will always be a platform for black women's stories. And we must always, and that's why I love the collaboration that you did, because I think we always need to make the circle bigger, but also open up, open up that space for ourselves, because I don't think that anybody else will will create that for us. And that's what I love about what the Cheeky Natives has been able to do. So I'm excited. Write your book, girl. We'll launch it. <laughs> right? No, that was, you better buy 10 copies of that book. I don't care if it's good or not. We're going to what? <laughs> you better buy 10 copies of that book. Friend, even 20. I know people who love books, even 20. But um, yeah, please, please read. We're so excited. I, I'm like excited to hear from this book because I I love the growth that you're speaking about, but also because I feel like this book tells it tells a story and you can hear the story and you can hear the change and the complexities in, in the poems and it's exciting. Do you know what we call that? Growth. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Swim class. You cannot dive into their mouths to fish out a sorry. It's never worked that way. And what good is the sorry you had to drown for? Mm. Another difference in this book is that the poems actually have um, titles this time around. So why? You why do... Soft magic, I didn't have titles or numbers. <laughs> Next are their numbers. <laughs> and in this one, their titles and numbers. Growth. <laughs> You are not a mender of men. Mm. I want to break the Messiah in you. Mm. Not everyone is yours to save. Woo! Mm. Speak on it. <laughs> Sometimes mm. I walk in hurt from the day. How much tired is in black living? Mm. I want light bones and lots of money. I want it easier. I want it white with little sorry.
And this is, um, the, so the first drawing I showed you is from uh, Neo, and this one is a, one from Nulama, and it's one of my favorites. When will you go back? What if back is a story you want to spit out? Back is your grandmother's body in the ground. Back is a heavy heart. Back is always a hungry pocket. Back is where your dreams give up on you. I wrote that because people always ask me as a foreigner, why, why do you live here, wherever it is I'm living? When are you going to go back? And for somebody who's, oh, can you buy the art? Is asking. Yeah, there is, I actually have it in here. So it, it um, yeah, anyways, <laughs> this poem I wrote it because I was just tired of that question because you don't know people's reasons for leaving. Um, yeah. So you said that these poems now have titles and there's been a little bit of a stylistic change. What, what influenced the, the change? Why did you decide to put titles and um, numbers? I, I, I'm still not settled on whether or not I like the titles or whether or not I like that they're there. But I just thought um, when people refer to poems and they're like, oh, I like so-and-so, you know, like they have a name that they remember and they're like, that was one of my favorite poems. Like, if, if the poem doesn't stick with you, maybe the title will. And it also helps me because I have horrible memory. But I'm like, oh, I know I'm, there's a poem I called this and that. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's still in the same vein of trying to respect poetry a little bit more mm -hmm. or respect this writing a little bit more and giving it a name. So this poem is called Waiting Bodies, Weighty Bodies. Every time I mean to write about my body, I laugh. How can someone be so unin love with this luscious, overflowing concoction of thigh and dark desirable things? How can that someone be me? How dare I? How I look in the mirror and grieve? How do I wake up in hate? And will I ever get tired of trying to make small of my heavy, mm -hmm. to make light of my darkness, to see beauty where I see ugly? Someone said they would die for a body like this. Well, someone is dying to leave this body. No, someone is dying to love this body again. Yeah. <clears throat> I also write a shady poem about fathers, but let me just skip that. <laughs> You don't even have to. You can. I'm curious, guys, because I'm the, the the body or your your body or your relationship with your body mm -hmm. features quite prominently in your in your poetry from soft magic to nectar and now to a fire like you. And I I I want to know what in what ways you think that writing about your body has changed from the first book to now. Have you come to different realizations about how you feel about your body? What mm -hmm. what has writing about your body in these three books done in terms of how you feel or where you are? Because I, I just think that our, our bodies are particularly for, for, for black women are mm -hmm. always it always feels like our bodies are a site of contention. We're always fighting with someone about something. So our features, our weight, our size, whatever is always a topic of debate or conversation. And I'm and I it's featured quite prominently in your poetry. So I'm I'm curious about that. So for me, I was actually thinking about this before we um, started this conversation. I, I was thinking that when I wrote Soft Magic, I was like, it's going to be this affirming poetry. I'll just say this one thing. and It would be like abracadabra. It would be like, feels good about herself again. And I thought that's how self-love works. Like, mm -hmm. just start looking in the mirror and say something that you'd like. But that's not, it's a gradual pro process. So throughout... Um, Throughout the three poetry books, I think there's this like also growth in how I view my body and how I view the process of loving my body. Um, it's not it's it's a journey that I have to consistently be on and be on top mm -hmm. of. But I think one of the most important things to me is the promise that I've made to myself to no longer be cruel to myself, to no longer be mean to myself. Mm. Um, I may not, I may never fit anyone's standard of beauty. And, um, but one of the people whose standard I should meet is my own. 
and maybe it's not being smaller being lighter being whatever maybe it's just sitting in acceptance and mm -hmm. i think for us to think that it's an instantaneous process is uh, a problem it's not it's not it's and in a fire like you i kind of address it like i do want to love my body again i do want to find the tools to stop um comparing myself with other people mm -hmm. or to stop you know trying to fit a mold and trying to be something that i never will be um yeah so it's a lot of like introspective work but uh in a fire like you i think i'm i'm really really um stressing like cut the crap with being you have to be better to yourself and it's maybe mm -hmm. it's as simple as okay today i'm just going to say words to myself tomorrow i'm going to do this i'm going to go to the gym i'm going to do this you know mm -hmm. as long as i'm my version of beautiful one day i'm going to be happy with that so i think that's what i'm working towards yeah <laughs> i guess that's kind of what i have to say about bodies cuz you know, being a black woman is it's tough it's mm, it's it, it really is a metaphysical dilemma it mm -hmm. really is um yeah. <laughs> i'm just quoting uh, i'm actually just quoting just like ishan when she says being black being woman and being alive is a metaphysical dilemma i haven't quite conquered yet you know you know, <laughs> to exist <laughs> on on so many realms of like sure most things mm -hmm. but it's fine i want to talk about black love okay let's talk about love oh gosh let me so I, didn't even, i didn't even finish the sad point it was just because you are within <laughs> <laughs> no you can finish you can you can finish we are we are here we are here for you <laughs> okay let me just yeah oh gosh let's see i don't even know what the time is so i might you should tell me but time you you've got you've got a whole 25 minutes <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> a few things you may reconsider. 1. That knife of a mouth. 2. A liking for the bottle if it comes with a disliking for yourself. 3. Hiding hot um hiding hot anger under thick laughter. 4. Mm. Talking yourself out of joy more times than into it. Mm. The the title of this poem is Softness is a gift in worlds and homes as hard as these ones. Poem one. Okay. Your no, mother has kind uh, there's a there's a request. <laughs> mm. Your mother has kind eyes. Is sorry she said those things. You know she'll say again tomorrow. Mm. Wishes you weren't so set on being so soft and breakable. wants you to take her abuse with a smile. Ooh, girl. Mm. Yeah, I think that we got, we kind of we always view the mother as the best and all these mm. things and um I have a really incredible mother, but I I know people who have this really difficult relationship with their mother. Mm. So I think I read the poem about that because hey, sometimes it's abuse mm. hunger uh a poem from hunger just getting there i really love list poems <laughs> so this is a list poem one are you ungrateful for wanting your forgiveness to look nothing like your mother's no mm. two You are taught that men are gods, that God is a man, that God is your father, that your father is God. 3. In your story, home and wound are synonymous, just like mother and worshipper. 4. And what kind of love grows from a wound? 5. Are you ungrateful if you celebrate the day you left home? I mean wound. I mean mother, worshipper, father and God. 6. Growing up where you did and how you did, you know good and well that staying is only half of the story. It mm. may kick you in the pride every time. But the work of keeping a love warm and living is always worth it. Oof. Oof. 
All right. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. You know, like <laughs> the newly married folks. It's <laughs> no, but like I want to, I want to huh? dedicate this to my boy. Dedicate this. <laughs> no, I wasn't even going to go into all the lovely loveliness of it all. But it's also difficult. Like this is a person who was raised, you know, not in your household. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. And then especially if you come from a household that has experienced brokenness. Um, mm. it's difficult to not compare your relationship with that. Mm. So. Um, I I think you know, you, softness is a is a recurring theme, and you write about softness in in different ways. And you know, yes, uh, it was yesterday, the day before, we had Sarah Jane King, and she was talking about how Susan Kimsman says, you know, particularly when you're writing memoirs, uh, you should write from your scars and not your wounds, you know, but. Mm -hmm. Um, so not, yeah, from your scars, not your wounds, I'm paraphrasing, but I think that like a lot of the softness that you write, it's been interesting to see you write about softness, because I think that in the, in like soft magic and in nectar, in some ways we're writing from, from your wounds. And do you, do you also feel that like in a fire, like you, you're writing in many ways, retrospectively. So you're writing from your scars in the sense that you're writing about, about bad love and about these difficult things when you you found great love and you found this person who in many ways feels like a soft place mm -hmm. i mean definitely i think that was also i started writing nectar the year that i, I was i started writing nectar the year that i met my husband so yeah, <laughs> that, my that husband. Book, okay, i girl. still was like when this person would treat me good i'm like ah but that ravish person. So then that thing, <laughs> I, was, I was remembering all the things. So I think for a fight like you, I'm, I am truly writing from, especially in wound, I'm writing from a place of scars, not wounds. So it's not open. It's not something that is constantly hurting me. Um, but it did hurt me in the past. And I think why I'm also trying to move away from writing all the sad poems and writing about all the hurt is because I don't want to constantly be reminded in my healing journey about what was. Um, mm. And I think in order for you to write sad poetry, sometimes you have to feel it. Like I'm a Cancerian. I don't know if that means anything, but I feel things so deeply. I'm an empath at least. And mm. like, if you're having a bad day and something crappy happens to you, I can just take on that energy so easily. Um, and so I, in order for me to feel better about myself and to feel like I am actually on the way to a better healing rather than falling into depression again, I've had to step away from writing from the wound. Um, and even, even if you're looking back on it, even if you're writing from scars, it's difficult because you're like, yeah, that person treated me like that and I let them do yeah. that to me. Or, oh my gosh, so-and-so in my family is a crabby person and they've heard me all along. Oh, now I have to deal with them still. You know, it's difficult. Yeah, I think either way, writing about sad stuff is, is, is painful. Can be painful if you're an empath. If you're somebody who's like, oh, this is sad and it happened to me, it's okay. I can still write it. Good for you. I can't yeah. I feel this yeah. deeply. Mm -hmm. So I just want to read through some comments because uh, we've just been going through it. And Dini asked if you could please read the poem on page 140 of Nectar. Um, Lisa T says your list poems slap more when you read them. Um, what, what? Sorry? Says, I can't see Your that. list poems. So when you list your list poems, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. slap more when you read them. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And Moby says, he says, triggered, yo, triggered for those who have strained relationships with their mothers. Oh, sending love, sending love. Um, the Tokonolo is in love with you. Um, <laughs> you, DJ, I'm in the place. What's your DJ name? That's my serious question for you. <laughs> Stay tuned, y'all. You know, we're all we're learning new things about ourselves. I, I learned that I can bake. I've been baking yeah. things, surprising myself. <laughs> So, you know, maybe maybe this DJ thing is also in there somewhere, somehow. Ooh, Cheeky Natives Radio. 
manifesting <laughs> speak it speak it radio bookshop zonke um ruby ru says you are so beautiful ladies oh thank you um thank you so much we save this video we will lebu mohele wants to know oh lebu was in my class at my school hey girl hey mm. um she wants to know if signed copies are going to be available through the cheeky natives mm see Wait, first of all, I'm not allowed to go anywhere, neither are you, so I don't know. <laughs> But the lockdown will end, Mos. Yes, of course, of course. Um, and Ronaldo was asking me about copies of Fire Like You. I don't have, this is like my actual only copy of the book, but hopefully when lockdown is over, we can contact the people who distribute them here and that can work out. Somebody yeah. says I resonate so much with Upile as a person. Uh, it's B baby says she resonates so much with you as a person. Oh, thank you. We have a comment here where Ruby Ru says that writing about things that have hurt me feel like reliving the pain, and so I, I guess that also leads into the question of when you write about what you're saying. You know what we just spoke about about the sadness and the difficult times, um, and then you have to constantly rehash it when it's readings mm -hmm. and the like. Um, what what is the self care process then right because that is a valid question you know that constant reliving yeah. of these traumatic things that have happened to you mm -hmm. i mean if that's a legit question for me i i i wrote a poem in a fire like you about it because i thought um i did this poetry retreat with people and it just hit me that oh, i'm i'm in the business of selling my trauma and mm. i don't know if i'm you know like people come to a reading and they want the saddest poems and I'm like do you know what I had to live through for this and it, yes it's great it's amazing we all experience enjoy at the end we're happier and so forth but still it was so such a painful time in my life mm -hmm. and so I don't know I'm, I'm not exactly sure about what tools they are to make it better and probably therapy is one of, them, is one of the things that one might need Um, yeah, so I don't have a self care routine after that. Like, if I write a sad poem, I'm sad all day. Mm, so me. I'm actually thinking <laughs> of a of a quote that that as the writer's case, you know, who says that you know you need to deal with your traumas, right? Because basically if you don't what audiences will do will want you to constantly regurgitate your trauma and serve it on a platter for them for their consumption. And you, let, let me look for this poem. Because that's what I was trying to say, <laughs> and I think it's such a it's such a true thing that like often we we demand of like our favorite writers and to to package their trauma for our consumption. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for writers? What does that mean for people who haven't processed that trauma, who then put it into into a book and then constantly mm -hmm. have to relive it? I just have a, an interesting comment here. Kanyele Musawenko, who's a poet, says. Um, Lockdown has been a blessing in disguise for me. I've always wanted to attend Cheeky Natives events, but I live in Cape Town. Yay! There Yay. are. That's a great comment. Yay! Thank you. We're looking forward to having you on the Cheeky Natives one day. Yay! What is happening? Oh, my sisters are here. Hi, sister. Hi. <laughs> Your sisters are the best, loving. I know they're amazing. <laughs> Should I read the poem since we're talking about suffering? It's pretty long. Read it. Or do you still want to read? Uh, so the first part is in quotation. So hopefully that carries. I've never, wait, I've read it once. So the title of the poem is Poetry Won't Suffer If You Smile Now. Mm. <sighs> Be a dear. Hurt for us here. Forget the wound. Knit the words together, hurt for us here. We'll pay good money, we'll cry those tears, we'll go back to our homes and forget we left your shaking, they say. Mm. Honestly, I can't keep pulling from the ruin. I can't keep returning to the ruin. I can't keep being the ruin. You would like my trauma hot and heavy and at the snap of your fingers. I know Ew. myself to give to pull it from somewhere and to pour it where you please. This is a story you know, but I tell it over and over because it's easier to tell than the story that scares you, the one of joy, 
but one of how I've learned to listen to my sadness, to hold room for it without handing it the house. The one where I accept only good things and revel in them. I have spent what feels like a thousand lifetimes living in hurt and thinking it the only life I was worthy of. But now, having made it to the other side, the side black girls are often told they'll never find, I know this is a vicious lie and real life is waiting for us to begin. Mm. I think that was my uh, <laughs> goodbye to poetry. <laughs> I actually saw such a beautiful comment here where someone says, I think that you are in the business of selling healing. I think that's mm -hmm. such a beautiful, beautiful comment. Love it. Love it. I, I love it too. I, I think we have this conversation often. Yeah. About I, I'm telling you that it, for me, one of the hardest things is when people come up to me and I'm not trained in anything. <laughs> I'm not even trained in poetry. I don't have a degree in writing. Um, and they come up to you because they can see themselves in your work so deeply and they tell you their saddest stories. I'm trying to make myself proper here. And I've been <laughs> they tell you their saddest stories and you just don't have the tools to fix them or to help them. Um, so I, I've, I've written down a lot of sadness, but I've also experienced a lot of it um, in the poetry readings and so forth. For me. I want to talk about black girl joy there's there's so much joy in this poetry there's so much joy in this book in this book and i think mean, there's so much love in this book black love things um your your acknowledgement uh you acknowledge mm -hmm. your your husband um in in the book and it's it's such a beautiful acknowledgement uh, when people buy the book, they'll know what I'm talking about. They'll know exactly why. I'm oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I um, always forget. <laughs> <laughs> but how, girl? How, girl? How? <laughs> um, and I'm curious about what what new what being newlywed, but also what full love and experiencing full love has done has done for your poetry, has done for the kinds of things that she writes about, but also has mm -hmm. done for your imagination of, of black of black love. First of all, it's messed up my poetry. I'm like, can't you just be a jerk for one day? Why do you have to be so great? What? <laughs> Girls it don't have it. content. It's not aligning with my brand as a poet. Like to be in love. It's not a Guys, I rebuke. My... <laughs> I think for me, for me, what um, <laughs> what being in love has done and to my work is it's changed. It's transformed how I viewed what I was worthy of. I think I thought I would be writing sad poems forever. I'm just going to be the poet who writes sad crap the rest of her days Look at because that. she doesn't think she deserves anything better than to reflect on what has happened in the past. Uh, Only bad yeah. things are coming. But when there's this wholesome love, it mm. just teaches me, it's taught me how to, it's taught me what the previous would be who wrote the two other books deserved. Oh, and, oh. Mm. <laughs> And when I read Soft Magic or Fire Like You in places, and I'm thinking, yo, I wrote this poem because so-and-so did this to me. Mm. How did I survive that? And how, and in that moment, I must have thought this was okay. Mm. Mm. Um, now, I'm just a different person when I approach mm. these poems. I'm like, I wish I could heal for that girl who wrote those poems, you know? I wish I could go back and be like, mm, delete that number, you know, like, don't go back to that place. Mm. There are better things waiting for you. But I mean, if I didn't experience any of that crappy stuff, I wouldn't know how much to uh, celebrate and revel in the goodness that my relationship has been thus far. I mean, it's almost four years of my life with this person, and I don't necessarily remember what was before. Like, oh, I have to read those poems to be like, ish huh what okay and yeah that, that like, wholesome love like, i see so many people in the comments saying locate me and you know what may wholesome love may wholesome love locate everybody yeah. in the comments oh god i'm speaking wholesome <laughs> healing love 2020 it's everybody's portion no it's so good to feel seen 
Oh, oh gosh, it's like the best feeling. Anyway, you are within too, so yeah. <laughs> you tell us how it's affected how you view the world. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, I think I think I am a little bit softer. I think that like before, just as a, a combination of things that had happened, of what I do, they, there were just a lot of things. I think that there was a that there was a cynicism that was a that was like a shield that was protective. But I I think that you can't go into into love and into wholesome love with with a shield of cynicism and of distrust mm -hmm. and dis of disbelief. And I think that like wholesome mm -hmm. love has required. A vulnerability of me that I didn't know that I was of, of capable of, but it's also shown yes. me that like that that love is a soft landing, right? So that you can be vulnerable in your whole self mm -hmm. and have and have a soft and have a soft landing and have a have a place yeah. where I mean I was saying this to my husband the other day that like you often feel that as a black woman, so much of how people perceive you is limited by their imaginations of what black women should be or how black women should be treated mm -hmm. or how black women should be loved, right? And so much of that also then influences how you look at yourself. And, and to walk into wholesome, full love is to be loved by somebody whose imagination is not confined by what they think society requires you to be or to do Yo, or to be yeah. like. That and so, is... Ooh, and so sis. that's that, right? It's just, yes, it's just sis. to be loved as something whose imagination is not constrained. Yeah. I tweeted about it. I was like, this man just feeds me and cuddles me, and all I give him is drama. And I'm thinking about it, like, yes, that's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great because, you know, when I constantly have these conversations with like older women or my mother, people mm -hmm. are like, oh, what kind of wife are you? You know, like, what, you know, these are the, this is your role, this is what you should be doing, and so forth. Mm. And I'm like, I've just met my friend, you know? Yeah. Like somebody who, <laughs> who I'm deeply in friendship with this person. Beyond love, this is the friendship I am. I know how deeply you protect friendship and how you think it's so important. And I've met somebody who's like that. You know, like we, we've had conversations, you and I, before I was married about what love looks like mm. and what... <sighs> what? Well, it's yeah it's a lot hey <laughs> it's it's overwhelming mm. the best kind of overwhelming mm. but also there's a lot of unlearning like hey you are actually here don't have to pinch yourself anymore you are here this person mm. is willing and capable mm. and worthy and kind mm. and they see you mm. stop Speak trying to be something else you Girl, a love poem. A love poem to close to. I know. I'm going to follow it up with a love poem. Please, girl, please. And me, I just want to dedicate this to all the, the lovers. And I'm love is not just romantic, right? I think that we place so much emphasis on romantic love as being the this, this standard, almost, right, mm -hmm. of, what, of what, like, love looks like. But love is also communion between friends. Love is also mm -hmm. community. Love is also black women coming through for each other, right? Love is so Ew. many things outside of, out of, of the romantic. And I think that we do mm -hmm. a disservice to love to limit it yes. to this idea of your partner. And mm -hmm. that's just it. When love is, is so, is so much. And when black women keep, keep showing each other really what love looks like every single day, black women show up for each other. I know. I mean, like, when you think back on your life, and I look back, like, this man did this, this man, I'm like, wait, but who hasn't disappointed me? Like, who's disappointed me less in my life? It's the black women who have invested so much in friendship with me, and I them, you know, it's my other women, my Chicana friends, and so forth, who have been there for me in more ways than any kind of romantic person would. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like who've seen the ugliest parts of me and still mm. showed up, and I didn't and think stayed. that our yeah, like our friendship was gonna be you know ruined because like you constantly like oh my partner this, my husband that, or whatever this. If I do this and that, but there are these people who we constantly take for granted who have been there and seen us and are ugliest. Anyways, so <laughs> I don't know if I should read from Sister or Sue now. <sighs> oh, girl, we have four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we have four minutes. Time has just flown by. I don't know where. This is what I told is. you. <laughs> anyway, let me just read uh, one point that's important, and the last point. Maybe we can also look over the questions. Okay. 
this is the drawing for it. This is by Nero. Um, let black girls be. I was born on a Wednesday, raised a good black child with bubbles in her hair. Cute, quiet and curious at first, quieter and less curious later. Where does it go? This fearlessness and hunger for the world. Who kills it in black girls? To be a black girl is a thing of grace. If I am ever a mother to one, mm. I hope she never falls into doubt with herself. I hope she doesn't hesitate to eat the room and everyone in it. I hope she is loud and certain of herself. Existing can be done in the quiet. But black girls, black girls weren't meant for that kind of thing. Black girls were made for boldness and boundlessness. <laughs> so people are asking if we can just do another like 15 minutes extra because you know what, girl, they are, we didn't they, drink. they are not tired of you. So like maybe another 15 minutes extra and then I'm back, mama, papa, I'm back, yo. <laughs> yo, yo, this is one. Guys, I'm trying to see you for, for my radio. Uh, I, I, saw, I saw a lot of encouragements in the comments. Thank you. Well, the people who oh, believed in God. you. I'm ready for it. Go get that bag, sis. Sis, all the bags. All the bags are mine. All the bags are ours. All the black, bags of black girl magic things. Yes, I cannot wait. I'll be tuning in. I'll buy a radio just to listen to your radio show. Yo, don't worry. You can even stream us. We'll be on DSTV, Cheeky Native Things. Um, so you, we were, we were, you were still reading about love. And I mean, I, I think that we've spoken a lot about sadness, but I, I love that you, I think even in, in, in your previous book, so even in Nectar, you spoke a lot about joy and joy from love and what that looks like and so i'd really really love to hear some love poems um okay because i'm here i'm here for the joy as well right i'm here, I'm here for, for yes i'm here for for black women having a multiplicity of of like experiences and stories right i think that people often want to hear about our pain and our trauma but but not are not super keen sometimes to hear about our joy and hear about the mm -hmm. things that bring us light. Some always I'm I'm here for it, girl. Okay, let's do it. Um, let's do it. <clears throat> this poem is called "Fruit." Mm. Faced with a love like this, I now know how the thing that craves goodness in the deepest parts of us wins in the end. Do you hear the vuvuzelas? And it's Friday, Girl, I'm sorry. Just, I'm, not, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. There's a dirty poem in here, and I might not read it, so let me just keep going. Read that dirty poem, sis, read it. I mean, read it's it. barely dirty. Like, it's, it's very... So this is the drawing for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> read it, girl. I think the furniture knows. What we make is magic. We crawl under and over and into each other. Mm. We make the sheets blush. The walls have never seen an act quite like us. Hello. We make the sheets blush. Yes. <laughs> yes. Get your life. All I know of astronomy. When you swim my thighs with your fingers, we look like two galaxies touching. Black body over black body. And in my bed were a binary star, orbiting so close to each other. Your light and mine are convincingly one. <sighs> my question about the vuvuzelas is, do you just all have 10 vuvuzelas at your house at all times? Like, that's a question for South Africans. I'm posing to you every single day we're hearing vuvuzelas. But I guess it's I don't our know version of singing vuvuzelas. You're hearing every day, anyways. Huh? I don't know about these vuvuzelas you're hearing every day. <laughs> we don't have those in the South, okay? No, every day. Maybe it's just the life in Randall. <laughs> Someone help me out, guys. Well, vuvuzela is a South African staple because... <laughs> we, we get it. 
we get it. I mean, your Vumuzelas are driving our dogs crazy. Okay. Oh, how are your dogs? He's fine. I, someone should come collect him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Endure is a filthy... Ooh. Endure is a filthy word. Mm. Love doesn't mean to make light of all your darkness. Meal out of bone. Enough mm -hmm. out of too little. Some more love bones. Soon. You came and the poems gathered and the walls fell and my love was let loose. Mm. Okay. Even though I, my husband would object, he'd be like, oh, you wrote those love poems before you met me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know so let's go to sister, which is, um, so this is the drawing. The Lama was expe uh, exploring uh, the feminine form. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a drawing for sister. Someone says, Vuvuzela is our South African footprints. Hey, there you have it. Yo, it's like, but it's, it, I don't even know if it's in people's houses. I think they purposely go out into their yard, <laughs> so we must all hear. <laughs> but it's okay, you know? <laughs> I don't even know what to say, French. <laughs> so this poem is called Nectar. I think one mm -hmm. of the things that I also did in Fire Like You is I connected mm -hmm. the three books uh, in one. So there's some poems that um, are titled things that are in the previous two books. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. Nectar. One day our mothers may ask, who do you love completely? Mm. May we grow to respond, ourselves, ourselves, our lovely selves. Sure. And so this poem is uh, Anaya's poem. Anaya is my niece. She's also my godchild. And I was in the room when she was born. Mm -hmm. And she is loud and fiery. And she just, she is two years old and you can't tell her anything. And I just, I wish I was like that as a little girl. And I wish more little girls are encouraged to be like that. Mm -hmm. um, she's courageous and she's so opinionated and she's mm -hmm. so in love with herself. Like, you know, she looks just like, oh, I'm, I'm so pretty. And then she, she just has all this personality. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times people suppress that in little girls. They want them to be obedient. They want them to be quiet, mm -hmm. um, to play with dolls. She likes to go outside and just have the best time of her life. And so... This poem is called Anaya's Poem. Mm. I was in the room when you first graced the world with your breath. Yelling and crying, we heard you then. And we have heard you now. Make us hear you always. Whew, girl. I think... Um, this is the drawing for deliverance. Um, mm. It's just a lady laying down. And it, it, I asked for that because the poem has to do with rest. Um, mm. I think we're all really trying to be overproductive now and do this and do that and learn how to make scones. <laughs> or <laughs> um, but I think especially during lockdown, it's just, it's difficult. So deliverance. Mm. If you find yourself very black and very tired, very tired and very black, very woman and very black and very tired, rest and mean it. This poem um, was actually from my sister Sarai, who was here. I don't know if she's still in, in, in the, on the live, but I'll read it for her. The loveliest of loves. You always calm the broken things in me. You lift me above myself. You are a sister and a home. Mm -hmm. You are a kingdom of forgiving. I am sorry if you've ever had to stretch your life for me. All bonds bend. But if this life has given me anything, it's the blessing of being loved by you. Mm -hmm. 
I wrote this other poem for a friend who was really, really depressed um, at the time. So it's called Ambush- Ambushing Goodness. Mm. You're stubborn in your sorrow, adamant on being unkind to yourself. I could shake you for it. When I found you dancing in the drink, acting joy, poorly, I want to pull you out from under it all, clean you, give you what love I can, wait with you on the corner for good things to come. Shoot. I wrote this poem before Uwe Nene was murdered. Um, And I just had to include it in the book. Um, It's called Each of You. Um, Because I I was tired of having to retweet photos of missing black girls every single day. Mm. Day one, it still is. The missing black children constantly. Mm. Um, So, each of you. Siswa, home is going mad. Mm. Home is a wound. We are always looking for you. Siswa, we are missing in our own lives. Our lives are filled with missing you. Mm. Siswa, we are lost too. Every day more missing girls. Every day stories cut short. And this is a drawing by Yulama. Mm. And the poem is, this too is a love poem. Oh, mom. Yes. I know you never meant to teach me fear mm. or how to look danger in the eye and crave it. But here we are. Here we are alive and willing. And that's all you need to be to learn something new. And I will end with a poem that is called Sister. Um, and this is the drawing by Neo, which I really love. Mm. So it's just two black girls at the beach having the yes. time. Yes! <laughs> and hopefully we'll do this again soon. Once lockdown is over, we'll have this moment again. Yeah, and, and we'll have a newfound appreciation for... Ooh. You know, I I used to be like, oh, I'm an introvert. I really like to stay home. And, you know, I'm a homebody. <laughs> I miss the outside. I want to outside again. <laughs> okay. This poem is called Sister. Sister, come and bask in this joy with me. I am here because you held my hand. Your sisterhood has made this terrible life light and breathable mm. thank you so oh, all right girl coming <laughs> through coming for our wigs uh, let me adjust my wig because you snatched it Snatch. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. let me adjust Bam, when i get out of here i'm getting a wig the best kind Take girl, my wig well, <laughs> so i got cornrows before this before the lockdown i got cornrows mm. The most expensive cornrows I have ever paid for, but it's fine. I mean, I came after hours. Guys, my cornrows are holding on, hey? Yes. They must. They must. But I'm also very grateful for this for this week on the days when my cornrows are unable to to can. Um, (laughs) You know, there's a poem that you have. I think it's in Soft Magic. Uh, celebrate yourself from bone to marrow. You are magic, right? And I think that black girl, black girl magic is a recurring theme. You know, black girl magic is a recurring theme in all three of your books. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'm curious about what black girl magic looks like now. Now that you've you've had the the benefit of growth and had all of these things happening, right? Mm-hmm. What does what does black girl magic look like to Billy now? It looks like not comparing. Um, mm. I think comparison is just, yeah. What is it? Is, is it a thief of joy? Yes, it is a thief of joy. I think, 
being someone who's overly competitive and who always wanted to be the best, wanted to be on top, who wanted to work extra hard, who wanted all these accolades, um, who, you know, I reached a point at 25, I, when I turned 25 last year, I was exactly where I told myself I would be. I said, I'll graduate from Oxford, I'll be married, right. this, I'll do this, I'll do that. Like, I've, I'd be published, mm. and I fulfilled all those things. And I was like, what next? Like, that was my peak, though, all, be humble peak. Some people are like, oh, I want to be a millionaire, a billionaire, whatever, by, by this mm. age. That was the limit I'd set for myself. And once you've reached that, once you've achieved that, what next? There's still so much more life, mm. like Yara um, says. Yasha, Yasha says, um, Daily Wire says, there's more life. I think more love. There will be more love, or there'll be more life. Um, so for me now, Black Girl Magic, having done all those things, it's rest. It's truly mm. finding enjoyment in the little things, getting to know myself more, um, experimenting when it comes to photography, writing other things, like constantly um, not, not trying to keep up with anybody else's standard of what success looks like, because I did that already. Mm. I was the ideal child. I did everything right. I did everything by the books, but did I find joy after it? Not mm. necessarily. It's cool. It's a nice degree to look at. It's a nice whatever to look at. But am I my happiest because of those things? No, I'm my happiest because um, of friendships that I've nurtured, of my relationship, or of habits that I've created for myself. So Black Girl Magic now is constantly learning i think that's where i got it wrong mm -hmm. in the beginning i thought that you achieve all these things you do all these things you say all these affirmations all of a sudden you love yourself you be the best version of yourself and so forth i think yeah black girl magic is constantly trying to improve myself mm. and just resting not letting life kick me all the time you know sure um, <laughs> I love I love the poem for your for your goddaughter for your niece. I think that like you know, so this has been quite a reflective week. Uh, we had Jamil Farouk Khan who wrote this mm -hmm. beautiful memoir and I mean there's a particular scene that he details about being being a black child, being in school and always wanting to be good and always wanting to not be problematic mm -hmm. and always wanting to tick those boxes. And I and I think of how like the academic environment, how just the life in general, how so many of us as black children can remember a point in time where it felt like someone stole your joy. Someone stole mm -hmm. your joy or someone changed how, how you look at yourself. So where you were effervescent, you were happy, mm -hmm. you were this exuberant child. Somebody took that and made it to be a bad thing, right? So I made this thing mm -hmm. of like being loud and taking up space and being joyful and being bubbly and made it a bad and made it a bad place and almost deprived you of that and caused you to have and caused mm -hmm. you to have an anxiety and seeing little black girls who are carefree and happy makes me mm -hmm. wonder where where that was snuffed out for so many of us, right? And I loved I loved hearing that poem because I think that we need to preserve preserve that in our in our in our little black girls preserve that taking up of space that bugginess that joy that that thing where you walk into a room and you are like the most noticeable civil person right you yeah that's why i envy my niece she she walks into the room she's she knows what she is she knows who she is she takes up space and i think it's it's so innate in her but i that's why I also wrote the other poem about let black girls be because I was wondering at what point in my life did I become shy shyness was my issue did I become afraid of public speaking and actually writing <laughs> and the business of writing involves yeah. speaking and trying to sell your work mm. and somehow I was trying to counter all that shyness and all that um, fear which is, it's crazy. I think I was trying to heal Obile from shyness. And heal your inner child, right? I, mm -hmm. I think that a fire like you is, a, is, is such important, Greg. I think that it's, it's a reclamation of self. I think it's a reclamation of black girl joy. It's a reclamation of 
the love that we so richly deserve, the love that is like our birthrights, this love that we deserve from everybody, not just romantic love, but this love mm -hmm. that I think that black women, that is ours, right? That is ours yeah. without explanation, without apology, that it's, it's just, it just is ours, you know? Um, so I guess, I didn't even talk about the title. Why is the book? We just like went straight into it. Um, but what is a fire like you before we, before we, you know, before we close it off? But what, what is a fire like you? Where is the fire like you? Um, I think for me, my favorite poem that I've ever written from Nectar, and it's on the back. I'll just read it really quickly. There is danger in letting people misname you. Hey. If you are a fire, do not answer when they call you a spark. Um, and that's where the title came from because I think it's inspired by people like my niece and I, just people who know themselves true. So in, in self magic, I was trying to know myself in nectar. I was looking for my voice and a fire like you, I was like, here I am. I am a fire. I'm a bad. I don't know if I can cuss here. <laughs> I've been trying to You're bad, bad. I'm a bad, bad. And yes. I deserve everything, like every bit of goodness that finds me is mine. I claim it. Um, and so that, that fire is just that acknowledgement of self, of um, knowing to care about yourself, knowing that when you're in certain spaces, imposter syndrome, syndrome is a complete lie. Like that space was yours. That space has your name all over it. And yes. so I think <laughs> for me, it was trying to remember people to remind people to ignite that fire within themselves constantly back themselves you know you have to be someone who backs yourself especially mm. if you are a black woman such and such and the other intersections and so forth that make up who you are um because these spaces won't hear you i mean when i came up with the title i was in oxford actually and i was the only black student in my class um in my year I was the only African and I constantly got all of these questions. I constantly felt out of place. Like I would go from mm -hmm. class to home, class to home and not interact with other people, go beyond that because I was really, really scared. And I was like, mm -hmm. why now? This is your second uh, mass time around at, at a master's. You, why don't you believe in yourself still? And so I read the poem, uh, the, the poem that I just read earlier. And I was like, the next title for my book should be A Fire Like You. Like, you are a fire. You are incredible. Mm. You are so important. You are everything. You are love. You are deeply mm. amazing. Your talent deserves to be seen, uh, to be celebrated. And yeah, mm. so that's what A Fire Like You is. Just remembering that you're a bad, bad. <laughs> I love, I love that. I love also what Mr. Kotlaib you said the other day. You know, we asked, we asked her about imposter syndrome, coconut cows. Uh, we asked about uh, imposter, and she said no, she doesn't have imposter syndrome. She had been in this game for mm -hmm. ten years. She'd been working towards all of these things, and so these things really are a summation of her efforts and a summation of her talent. They're reflective of her talent, and she is so. Dis she knows. Mm -hmm that like she she should be there, that she doesn't feel misplaced. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing to hear, that you know that you deserve to be there, that you know that, as James Baldwin said, that the, the price has already been paid for our crowns. All we need to do is wear them. Um, so yeah, thank you for an amazing, amazing, amazing session. This was beautiful. I'm like revived, I'm healed, I am reclaiming, I'm just doing everything. But that's just that says a lot about your friendship. Like every time I talk to you, I'm like, yes, I'm gonna go out and do that. Like, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you hype us all up. Thank you for having. Yay! Me. I love that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, where can people get your book on Amazon? Are there audio books? How how do people go about to get? And how do people book you? Because lockdown will end, and then we're going to support mm. the arts. We're going to do amazing things. So, mm. how can um, how can people buy your book? Are there audio books available? And also, mm. how do people support Upile Chisala? Okay, well, um, so you support me by um, buying the books. <laughs>
and not buying any sort of PDFs online. Um, that Stop that thing. Back to people. Um, you support me by going to Amazon, Loot, or what does it take a lot in getting the book exclusive mm -hmm. yes. books when the bookstores open again. Um, there are other little bookstores that hold my book. Um, you support me by showing up to events when we have them. By caring about poetry, you support me by supporting the artists who contributed to this um, book, Neo Haji and Lula, Lulama Wolf, who are both incredible. So there is, there are audiobooks for all three books. Uh, yes. by, like you soft magic and nectar and it's available on audible on libro fm um I'm, I'm not sure where else i don't know if amazon does that but it's available wherever audiobooks are available and then there is a combined collection of me speaking on all three books which is called as soft as a fire and that will have me reading all three poetry books but also i give a little bit of commentary i speak a little bit about the process of writing um, those different poems. So you can definitely find those audiobooks. And, and then you can find me on my page, Being Upile. Uh, yeah. And you can also email me at beingupile at gmail.com if you have something to say. Yeah. <laughs> and, Sorry, uh, you said you said, and you've got ebooks as well, right? Ebooks. So the ebook, yeah, version is Kindle. It's a Kindle version of the book. Um, I'm not sure. There was a problem with Kindle, but I think that they fixed it. So you can definitely get the Kindle version on Amazon and other places. But yeah. Thank you so much, Upile. This is just love and love and love. Love and love and love. Love. You feed my soul. <laughs> love on love. Um, this has been beautiful. It's really, it's been amazing to commune, right, with with you and with so many people on, on, on our live. Super excited. So thank you so much to everyone. On Monday, we have Sue Nyasi who wrote Gold Diggers, The Polygamist. We have a fire week again next week. The Cheeky Natives, ne? It's just yeah. bringing the heat. So next week, we've got Sue Nyasi, Landa Mabenge. We have Kise Lemon. We have um, Sadia Hardman. Yeah. We have Nicole Dennis Ben. So we're just bringing the fire. We believe that this time is a time for writers and poets and it's a time for the arts. And we are so, so excited. Thank you once again, Upile. Please go out and buy every single one of Upile's books. Please support Newa Paji. Please support Lula Ma Wolf. Um, we are we are our own we are our own community. We are our own best thing. So thank you, everybody. Do I say this? Or no. <laughs> Please save it, girl. Save it. I don't know if it'll cancel the other one if I save this one. But okay. No, sure. it won't. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. Guys.